Hello and welcome to episode 62 of the Metacast Behind the Scenes podcast. I'm your host, Ilya Bezdilev. And I'm Arnab Deka. We are co-founders of Metacast, a podcast app that has transcripts that helps you learn from podcasts. So with Metacast, you can read your podcast if you want to, you can search podcasts, you can make bookmarks of the things that were said, and you can share insightful moments with those who you care about. And in this podcast, we talk about our behind the scenes of building the app. And today is a very big milestone for us. What is it, Arnab? We did a big, very soft launch <laughs> onto the Apple iOS App Store. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what are the next steps and give you a little bit behind the scenes of the things that we should have done earlier that would have made this launch easier. And I think Ilya will eventually write this up in a nice blog post so that people who want just a summary of those, they can go read it. But I think if I were to build an app and launch it again, there are some things that we would have done differently. So we'll talk about some of those today. And we try to keep every episode to about 30-ish minutes. We don't always succeed, but we're getting closer and closer to that aim. So that's what you should expect today too. Cool. Today is September 25th is when we're recording this. And we pushed our app to the App Store on Friday, which was September 19th, I believe it was. I mean, we have been attempting since like September 14th or so. I mean, the actual launch, actual soft launch happened on Friday. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the whole thing, right? We were ready to submit the app to the App Store at some point, just about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Yeah, I think it was 14th or 15th we submitted the first time. I thought it took longer. I thought it took over a week to get approval from Apple. You may be right. You may be right. Yeah, because we did have quite a few rejections that we'll talk about. So, yeah. Yeah, I think rejected by Apple should be the title of this episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, soft rejected by Apple should be the title because it wasn't outright rejected. <laughs> right. It was pretty soft. Anyway, so we were ready to launch as in we had all the code complete. We put together nice pictures and we started to fill in the form for the app submission. Actually, one thing that I wanted to call out right away is the very first issue we faced when we were submitting to Apple. Yeah, and you are going to be talking about the problems today because who wants to hear about success stories, right? <laughs> it's not one of those <laughs> success stories. It was not as simple as I expected. So I created all of those nice pictures. I uploaded them to the form. I hit submit and it tells me, well, you know what? You also need pictures for the iPhone in the 5.5 inch screen size, which is the iPhone 8 and below. Those are the phones that still had the button. The big button at the bottom, touch ID, yeah. Yes, so they have a different aspect ratio from the newer phones, well, newer. iPhone X came out, I think, in 2019 or 2018. Maybe 2016-ish or so. Yeah, like seven, eight years ago. And guess what? For those phones, for those pictures, you have to have the screenshots from the app in the same aspect ratio as the phone. So you can't just put pictures from like iPhone X, put them into the older phone. Well, the reason why they need these pictures is because if you're using the app store from one of those older phones, they will show you different pictures. So ideally you want to have pictures in the right aspect ratio. And also if you use the phone Chrome, you want to have the Chrome with the button on it so that it really resonates with the person who looks at the picture. And it turned out that taking screenshots from the app in the right aspect ratio was a challenge because we don't have a physical device that meets those standards. I use the simulator on the Mac to take the screenshots. I had to install the simulator for the older phone, the iPhone 8. But you know what? It doesn't support the latest iOS version. So I had to download and install the older iOS version. I think it was 16.4. So it took probably like extra 8 gigabytes of space on my hard disk. Piling on Xcode from last episode, it is pretty notorious if you want to install more versions, how much space it takes. and Yeah, I remember like command line tools take like 3 gigabytes or something. It's just... Crazy. There are websites and like SaaS tools available, by the way, if you want to take screenshots of your app in different aspect ratios and devices. But they also require a lot more that we were not willing to do at that point. So we were like, okay, we'll just do this on the simulator is what you decided. 
Right, but also some of the screenshots you want to take maybe like mid-action. So you actually want to have control over what you're doing. Also, I'm logged in with my account. So it's easiest to do it on the actual phone. If you don't have the phone, the second easiest is the simulator. It's just preparation for that took a bit of effort. Okay, that was done. The other challenge that I had, they also asked for iPad screenshots, which, because we build in Flutter, and it automatically builds an iPad app for you as well, and uh, we did not specify iPhone as the only target in Xcode, so we had to spend a bit of time figuring out how to disable iPad, because our app runs an iPad, and it looks generally okay, but there are a couple of rough edges where it looks kind of broken, so like if you submit those screenshots, it's not going to be looking nice, right? So I actually have been using our app on my iPad. I don't use the iPad that much, but when I do, I have been using it on the side. And the player screen is actually way better to interact with compared to the iPhone because there's so much more space for the transcript. But we looked at it and we were like, okay, some of the other screens, especially when you see grid of like podcasts, and those grid, we have like coded it up for the phone resolution. So it will show like three things. Then on an iPad, it looks humongous. So we're like, okay, let's not fiddle with all this right now. It'll require some work, but not too much work. But we'll do this later for iPad and tablets and just disable it for now. So yeah. Yeah, what I learned from Stack Overflow is that if you submit iPad screenshots, I don't think you can take them back after that. It was an important decision that we decided not to fix the app for the iPad right now and just go with the iPhone app. So we basically disabled the iPad as a target. And now if you launch our app on an iPad, it looks like one of those apps that just is an iPhone app that runs in the middle of bigger screen. Like Instagram. I think Instagram still is like that or at least was like that for many, many years. So iPad is disabled, but you can still install it on iPad and you can still run it. It just looks like the phone form factor inside the big screen. And then so our success story continues. We disabled iPad, we provided all the screenshots, we put in all of the details that they asked for. Bang, submit. It's accepted. It moves to the status, waiting for review. And I think within 24 hours, we got the response back. Just overall, I think we were sending new submissions almost daily. I think we did it four or five times. Every time they responded back to us within 24 hours. It was pretty reasonable, very good. And the response was very clear compared to our Google experience. A few episodes back, we talked about the Google approval process where Google approved it almost immediately. But then after a few days, they sent us these policy violations with air quotes saying that your app will be removed from the app store. You need to fix this within like seven days. And we scrambled and fixed those things. But those things, the policy violations itself, the language used and the communication was very unclear about like, what are they actually talking about? Whereas this for the Apple one, yeah, there were like seven rejections and every day we would do this and submit again and something new would come up. But the communication process was super quick, like within a day they would get back. And it was very clear, like a human being was writing to us about like, you need to fix this or add this or remove that. Yeah. And they generally followed the same structure. It was your app doesn't meet the requirement, whatever, 1.7, make it up the number. And then there is a copy paste part of that requirement. And then something like in particular, and then they say, like, you have to have a working terms of service link in the metadata. So it was fairly straightforward, as in we didn't have to parse the whole guideline to understand what's wrong. They gave us the specific part of the guideline. But then it took some stack overflowing to actually figure out what they mean by metadata and where to put the terms of service link. Turns out you put the link in the description of the app. And when you look at the app, If you just search for Metacast in the App Store and you see the privacy policy in terms of service link at the bottom, those links are not clickable. Actually, I don't even know if you can copy paste them. I haven't checked. But the point is, it's just so weird that they are required to do it this way instead of just having like a terms of service field that they would convert into a link on the App Store. It just feels weird that they do it this way. And I think it took us a couple of submissions to actually figure out what exactly they wanted there. Because I think first time we understood that they wanted terms of service copy pasted into the custom terms of service field that they have. Because apparently you can use Apple's standard terms of service. 
EULA and user license agreement. But if you have your own, then you need to copy paste plain text in there, which I believe they used to run some analysis of it to make sure it covers certain things. And I think the primary thing there is that they don't want Apple to be exposed by any of our terms. We actually have a checklist, I think, of about eight items that tells you what your terms of service must contain. And all of that is about how it's all between you and the user, and Apple is just the provider of the platform. Makes sense. After this one is the rejection where if you try Metacast and you're trying to like purchase the subscription, then that subscription screen has a couple of options, right? The monthly and the annual. And then there are some terms of agreements and fine print at the bottom. And that screen is scrollable. But I think the reviewer either did not realize that it's scrollable or they were not happy that that fine print was below the fold. So they rejected that and said like, okay, you need to add fine print and all these cancellation terms and all that into this screen, right? And we were like, wait, it is in that screen. You just have to scroll a little bit more. But I think you did some work to change the layout of that screen so that it now shows above the fold on most form factors. Yeah, to be fair to us, <laughs> they were testing it. They set a screenshot which looked like an iPad screen with an iPhone app running inside it. It was running on a smaller screen device. If you look at our app on a bigger screen, like the screen that's standard right now, like iPhone X and older. Like 6.5 inch or... Yeah, I think 6.5 or 6.7. Yeah, one of those. Uh, so then you actually see some text at the bottom. It's cut off. So it makes you realize that actually you can scroll it. So there is more there. To be fair to Apple, when you look at it on a smaller device, it just cuts right above the text. And actually, all you need is on that screen. So unless you're looking for something else, it doesn't occur to you to scroll. So even if they scrolled, I think it's a good sort of pro-user requirement to have some indication that it's scrollable and all of the terms and other, other stuff is in there. So yeah, we just made a couple of minor changes to the layout to make sure that the half of that line sort of sticks out so the user can see that they can scroll and see more. And that was not all. Now it's about 17th of September, okay? And for a bit of personal anecdote, 18th of September is my birthday. And I was hoping that this is it, right? We'll submit this one more time and we're done. But then, Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we were getting that text in every single rejection notice that we did not submit one of the in-app subscriptions, in-app purchases, because we have subscriptions. And we couldn't figure it out because we thought you submit this with the app. So I think up until the point where it was the last thing remaining on the list, we were like, okay, so there is something going on there. I remember spending some time in Google and then I went to the uh, subscriptions page in App Store Connect and I found um, that there is like a ready for review button or something for the subscription. And I did like submit to review or whatever that button was, right? And then we submit the app for review again and it gets rejected again. And that was really frustrating. It was the point where I just wanted to write back to them. and like, it's all in there. What are you talking about, right? It's not like we are trying to violate something. We just can't figure out the UI, right? And then I think I asked you to submit because I was busy or something. Yeah, so the subscription, the UI is kind of weird, right? Like you're preparing your whole app for a subscription, but then you add a specific build version of your app into it. And in that screen, when you add a new version that has never been added before, that's when there is a place to also add your subscription products for the review. So I figured, okay, that's where it is. I added it, submitted. This is 17th of September evening. And I'm like, yes, tomorrow on my birthday, it's going to get approved into the App Store because now everything else is done. But then we come to 18th of September. I wake up, I look at my phone and hello, there's a rejection again. <laughs> yes. And the reason is, again, we did not submit something for review. And I, again, I'm going through the UI and I just can't figure out what's going on. So I think this one, we have two subscription options, a monthly and an annual one. And the annual one is priced at $49 in the US. And there is a 50% off intro offer for the first month until October 31st or something. Basically, if you buy the annual thing, then automatically you get a 50% discount for the first year. So it's $25. So what Apple rejected with is this $25 offer, which they see manually when they're reviewing the screen, they're not seeing that in the metadata is what they said, because the metadata has 49, instead of 24.99, it says 49.99. 
Right. And to be fair to Apple, they wrote like specifically the 2499 offer, right? Which is good. Otherwise, we would have never figured out what the heck are they talking about. Exactly. And then we go through our whole thing. We actually don't see any option to submit that specific introductory offer because it's part of the bigger price bundle or whatever it's called in Apple. So I write back to them saying that it is an introductory offer. It is part of the 49.99. It's just like 50% off. It's a temporary offer. Here are the screenshots from App Store Connect, which um, you have to be really motivated to find where these things are. <laughs> I don't know the interface that they are seeing, but for some reason they did not see this, right? Then I think the next message we get from them is the approval. Yeah, 19th of September. One day late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So overall, I would say I'm really pleased with the timelines and the thoroughness of the Apple review process. And also, I really appreciate the way they write the feedback and that they responded pretty quickly. It felt like a collaboration. It uh, didn't feel like fighting a giant, right? You know, we were just trying to meet the requirements and we were collaborating. It was all good. Their UI is horrendous, though. <laughs> Yeah, it felt like the people who were writing back to us could empathize with the fact that it's a lot of work to understand all this. And so they were being as helpful as possible. And I think this goes back to one of the recurring themes we have on this podcast, which is one of the big cultural difference between Apple and Google is Apple has a lot of manual processes and people replying to you in places. And Google has automated a lot of that. But that results in experiences like what we had with Google, which is they approved it the first time we submitted to production. They were like, great, go ahead, all done. It's on the Play Store. And then two days later, three policy violations of like, you have to fix this or we'll take down your app within three days. So the review process seemed broken. Right. And also, you know, it feels like season desist from Google, right? Because they already took it in and then like, we will kick you out if you don't do this. And those were simple violations, right? Imagine if it was something that we really had to like re-architect something. So we would be kicked out from the Google Play Store if we didn't meet it within seven days. It would have been a really bad experience. I would prefer this stuff to be front-loaded like it is with Apple. Yeah, like this took us a week. Yeah, but at least now I guess I feel pretty comfortable that they are not going to be sending us a random email with demand <laughs> to do something or else. <laughs> And then once it was approved, there is also a bit of confusion in their UI. It says app is ready for distribution or available for distribution or something like that. And we were wondering like, okay, does that mean we have to do something or not? Because we also could not see any obvious button to like distribute it. I think at the bottom of that screen, there was an option. How do you want to distribute the app? I think we chose manual, which means that once it's approved, it doesn't get automatically pushed to the app store. We control when we push the button. No, no, I'm saying after that. So on 19th of September, we received saying, you're approved, great. Then we decided, okay, why don't we just do it today itself? I think it was a Friday or maybe a Thursday or something, right? Yeah, and we decided we'll just do a soft launch and then we'll do all the other things later, which is the next part of this podcast we'll talk about. But then after we said, okay, launch it or whatever that button was, then the status changes to like ready for distribution or available for distribution or something like that. Oh, so it shows you some kind of Apple's internal status that it's like waiting in queue to be distributed or something. Yeah, and now we know it's been like four days. The app is available. The status is still the same. It's like ready for distribution. I remember you and I talking about, wait, is there one more step? Like, what do we do now? But anyway, after a while, I think the app started appearing in app stores in different regions and all that. Yeah, I think it took a couple of days for it to be fully available everywhere, or at least everywhere we were rechecked. Yeah, and in the beginning, when you typed Metacast, the exact word and there are no other apps like that at least in the US and Canada stores that we found called Metacast exactly it was appearing in like eighth or ninth place now I think it's starting to appear in the second or something like that second place or so yeah I think if you search for Metacast and nothing else just Metacast the first position for me in the US app store is the ad the second one is something from Meta Meta Oculus, Meta Rift or something. So it's their app for the VR. And then we are in the second position of the organic search results. And there is nothing else, just these two apps. So I don't know why they show the Meta. 
I don't get an ad for that search, but I do get Miracast, the screen mirroring app as the first result and then Metacast. And I think this will probably improve over time as we get more ratings and hopefully reviews and all that. Hint, hint, listener. Yeah. So in the interest of time, we want to talk about the next steps because we have a very sophisticated process we want to run to offboard our beta users into prod. So I suggest, Arnab, that we actually talk about this in the next episode after we have done it so that we can actually talk about the specifics because it will take probably 15, 20 minutes and it will be hypothetical, whereas uh, we can actually talk about the actual how it went after we've done it. And I think it will be done by the time we record the next episode. So that's going to be interesting. Yeah. So I think next up, why we are calling it a soft launch is we haven't talked about it anywhere. We are still doing some changes in the app to make it even better. And then we're going to start talking about it openly. But I think one thing where I'm starting to feel and realize is the marketing Right. I mean, we always knew that building the app is only the very first initial step. Now the actual game of getting people to discover the app is a way bigger challenge if you are a indie developer or a like a small company like us, Bootstrap. We don't have millions of dollars to like go market this everywhere. So that's going to be the big struggle for us, I think, over the next I want to say a few years while we also improve the app more and more and more. So, yeah. I agree with you. I think up until now, we were hesitant to go on other people's podcasts and um, do any kind of blog posts on Hacker News or Reddit. Actually, we have a really cool blog post that I'm going to be finalizing now about the whole launch process to the Android Google Play Store and Apple App Store, which we will update with the latest Apple things that we learned. Maybe we'll also put that offboarding from beta to the same post to be a very large, almost like a guide for people who are one step behind us. We want to post this to Reddit for indie hackers or for SaaS groups, you know, all this stuff, which could bring some extra eyeballs for us. But until we had the app in both app stores, it all felt premature because if you do something like that or go on a podcast, somebody else's podcast and talk about the app, and then somebody who uses an iPhone, they can't use it. Or well, they can use it with the test flight, but test flight is a pain in the ass. You have to install a test flight. And if you're not used to it, it's not worth it for many people. But now I feel like our hands are untied. One of the biggest challenges that we'll be working through that we'll be talking about in the next episode is how do we enable the paywall? Because if you're on test flight, you cannot pay for the app, but the paywall will be still in your face. And if you say pay, it actually asks you to enter the iCloud password in there, the Apple ID password. You can't use the password manager. And then you hit subscribe. It tells you that it's not going to be charging you. But 15 minutes later, the paywall comes back. And it's just so annoying. And the thing is, we do not have a mechanism to tell our beta users, now go download the app from the App Store. We have emails of the people who signed up with an email and we sent them an email. It was earlier today. No, it was yesterday. I sent the email to those uh, people. So of all of our iOS users, two thirds are anonymous users. Anonymous users all use Apple's private relay, which we haven't done the configuration. So we can't send emails to those people. So we can consider them anonymous. So we can't communicate to them in any way, right? So the thing that we should have done <laughs> like a year ago when we started building the app is a mechanism to send some kind of in-app notification to the user. Not just the OS level notification where you get like, oh, Metacast wants to show you something. No, it should be in the app itself where you, if you open the app, it shows you something that you want to show the user. That ship has sailed. We will talk in the next episode how we are going to work around that, but it's a complicated process. So yeah, if you're building an app, make sure you have the way to communicate to users if you expect some kind of transition and migration of those users in the future. Right. And I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next episode because we did build a mechanism to force users to upgrade to a version if we had to. We don't use it often, but if and when we need it, we do. But I think another mechanism to tell users to move from the app altogether into the production app, basically a communication mechanism, because if you support anonymous users, then that becomes a challenge to communicate with them. Yeah. I think with the forced upgrade screen, we made a mistake, well, mistake, quote unquote mistake. Uh, it's an oversight, right? Now in hindsight, we hard-coded a link 
to the test flight app. So if we had this in remote config and we could change the link, then uh, it would have been not a problem at all. We would just force them to upgrade and then it will be linked to the app store and they would go there, upgrade. Yeah, but that ship has sailed. We'll talk about this more in the next episode, I think. The force upgrade mechanism, the communication, as well as the beta itself presents a lot of challenges to move people off from the beta. Because we have like, I don't know the exact number, but like there were hundreds of people on both platforms using like a open beta version of the app that we have to have some way of telling them to move off the beta to use the production app. So we'll talk about this in the next episode. So let's close today with our what we've been listening to and reading and all that. Right. So I can start and I hope I don't get cancelled for mentioning the content that I can see, but I don't care anymore. So I've listened to only a couple of podcasts in the last couple of weeks. One of them was a Peter Thiel interview on Joe Rogan podcast. It is a three and a half hours interview. I love hearing Peter Thiel talk. I loved his book, Zero to One. I read it twice. I actually saw him live at Wharton 10 years ago. He just wrote his book and he was promoting it. And Adam Grant was the interviewer of Peter Thiel. And he was on stage uh, for the students. It was really cool. Yeah, he had some really interesting ideas. And it's kind of funny that he wants to be a contrarian on every single topic. So you do get to hear a lot of alternative ideas, some of which are interesting. Some of them I agree with. Some of them I don't agree with. But yeah, it's just an interesting episode overall. But if you are not into conspiracy theories, then it may not be (laughs) the best use of your time. (laughs) I think both Peter Thiel and Joe Rogan has intentionally, I think, developed that sort of a public persona being like conspiracy theorists. Yeah, it was fun. I remember I was not feeling well, actually. I was sick, but I didn't want to sleep. But I couldn't read because my eyes were hurting. So I just listened to the whole thing in one day, which is unusual for me. I would never listen to like a four hours episode on one day. The other one was the Donald Trump interview on the Lex Freedom podcast. Personally, I was so happy for Lex, kind of following him, how he sort of upscaled his persona. And now he gets a former U.S. president on his show. To be fair, if he had Kamala Harris on his podcast, I would listen to it as well. For me, it was interesting in the way that it's not some kind of like CNN or whatever, Fox News or something, talking to a president, like a professional journalist with an agenda. So Lex is a podcast bro, right? Like a tech bro. And then he talks to former U.S. president. So it was just a different kind of discussion than you would hear on mainstream channels, professional channels. And the funny part about that thing was I start listening to it and I go to the transcript and there is no transcript. It says, "Uh uh-oh, I couldn't load the transcript. I remember sending this to Slack. I'm like, of all episodes, the one where we failed to generate the transcript is this podcast. It's some kind of like left-wing conspiracy against Trump, right? The liberal left CTO (laughs) of Metacast has put in a flag specifically saying any episodes where Donald Trump is mentioned is not going to be transcribed. Right, yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then I had to go to the back end to sort of override that (laughs) so that uh, the right-wing fanatics could get the transcript. And I'm, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't say I learned anything from there, but it was interesting because Trump behaved differently there. He was less of a sort of bombastic working for the audience. It was an interesting interview, but like generally I didn't learn anything about listening to it. I also listened to that episode actually because Trump, the way he talks in like rallies and debates and all that is pretty bizarre. That's my perspective on it. But on this one, I thought he seemed more like a normal person, how you would have a conversation with. So I wanted to listen to that. I listened to maybe about an hour or so. I thought the typical like rambling behavior was there from Trump. Like you ask him anything and then he's going to like talk about something else and ramble about everything else. So that trend was there. I think Lex did a pretty good job bringing him back onto topics in that one hour that I heard. But I got the feeling that he wanted to ask a lot more follow-up questions, but decided not to ask. And I thought he had some great opportunities of like, I was wondering, okay, he just said that the thing that he said five minutes ago and this are contradictory. And I thought like Lex would ask about that, but he didn't. So it was a bit of a disappointing. But overall, I feel like this is the most normal side of Trump having a conversation that I've heard in a long time. Yeah, I think he was probably just working for the different kind of audience in this interview because people who listen to Lex are probably mostly intellectuals and uh, you will turn them right away if you yell. <laughs> things that he usually does at rallies, right? So actually, that made me remember a few years ago, I listened to an episode, the podcast called WTF with Mark Maron. 
It's a very famous podcast. He's a famous comedian. He had Barack Obama on his show when Obama was still president, I believe. So I must have been listening to like a very old episode. Before the actual interview, he was rambling for about 15 minutes about how the whole thing went. Because he did this interview in his home studio and how the whole street was blocked by Secret Service and all that stuff and how he was just like so anxious about the whole affair. I don't remember much of the interview, but I remember that part where he was just like so freaking out of interviewing the US president because it was like highest ranking guest ever on his show. So yeah, it was also a good one to listen to. I maybe I should re-listen to that. So what about you? So do you remember Dennis Taylor of the Bobbyverse universe? Of course I do. Just recently we got a comment. So we recorded a podcast interview with him on the Builders Gonna Build podcast, which we actually need to resurrect at some point. Yeah. Episode three released in February this year. Yeah. And somebody commented on YouTube saying that it was one of the best interviews with Dennis Taylor that uh, this person has ever listened to. So kudos to us. Thank you. Thank you. So the Bobbyverse series, I won't give you like the whole thing again, but it's one of the best fun sci-fi series that I've read. So book four came out like a couple of years ago. And so I was on a road trip for most of early September, September 6th, that book dropped. So I immediately got it book five and I'm about halfway through it now. It's so much fun. Basically, the things are getting grander and grander every book, but the style of the book writing with there's a lot of funny, like personality kind of things that come across in these AI agents. The story writing where the plot gets more and more interesting, but it's never boring where you feel like you want to give up at some point. And there are like four or five different plots going on. So I'm loving the book. So that's what I'm mostly listening to. And there's the occasional, like the daily podcast and all that, that I always listen to that's going on on the side. Do you feel like Dennis has grown in his writing as you're consuming his books one after another? I think he has a really great balance in knowing when to taper off. So my other favorite in this genre, there is another really good series called the X-Force, Expeditionary Force. And Skippy is like the main character in there. That series has like 10 or 11 books so far. And there, even though it was really fun, even more fun than I would say the Bobbyverse books in the beginning, the first three, four books, now I'm realizing that it's the same thing again and again. Every book, it's like a different crisis, but it's the Marvel movie kind of thing. You know what's going to happen after a while, right? Like the world is going to end and there's this character who's going to save it. I feel that way the Bobbyverse Dennis is doing an amazing job of it's not that kind of like world ending catastrophes all the time. It's more about the AI agents own struggles and things like that. And of course, there are once in a while, but not every book is about the same formula. Every book is very different. So that way I love it. This is not hard science by any means, but a lot of what he says is way more believable in a way that he explains how like a surge drive would work or subatomic communication would work. I am not that deep into physics, but it sort of makes sense to me. And I can feel like I do get it and it could work that way. Whereas a lot of science fiction, more in the fantasy side, is they don't explain how things work. They just say, oh, we go through the wormhole, but there's no explanation of how the wormhole works or anything like that. So he strikes a good balance between these two sides, I think, which keeps me engaged. So, cool. Yeah. I was working on a massive project at Google called Wormhole, and I still couldn't understand what they wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think this concludes our episode. And where can people find us, Arnab? So first things, I think you should go to metacast.app and that's where you can find our app in the footer there at the bottom. You can find links to this podcast as well as our other podcast, Builders Gonna Build. We've been sort of dormant on that as we have been focusing on the app. But now as we start to grind up our like marketing and all that, I think we're going to start to become more active on that podcast as well. And then Ilya does a really good write-up. Which I haven't done in a while, actually, because I've been working on that massive blog post. And I was like, should I send it to newsletter or should I not? 
but you do typically take our the more rambling more in the moment recordings like this one and compose them into concise more thoughtfully written <laughs> narrative form and you publish them so i think you can do that as well the our newsletter links all of those links are right on metacast.app and if you want to write to us you can write to at hello at metacastpodcast.com we personally read every single email that comes to us unless you offer us to buy some bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> well we do read those too and then we mark them as spam right and with that bye 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 see you next time <laughs>